many thoughts I seem to have. Um, however, whether they're all relevant or uh, of interest remains to be seen. I'll decide that myself uh, as I go along. I think the opening line that I want to uh, give you is that this is the tercentenary of copyright uh, coming into force uh, in, in the United Kingdom. And it was the United Kingdom. It has always applied across the, the, the whole of the, the UK. But it was, um, I might just sort of throw in my Scottish bit, I think quite importantly connected to the Union of 1707. Uh, um, now, the, the fact that copyright has been around for 300 years suggests that at some level it must be working. Um, even if it doesn't necessarily imply that it's perfect. And the basic idea of giving creators certain rights to prevent exploitation unless they first give permission, usually for a return, maybe, and that, uh, this is possibly the theme of what I've got to say, may be the least bad way of enabling creative pe people to gain income uh, from their contribution to society. I still think, and I'm saying this nervously because I just attended the preceding event where I, I see or I learned that Adam Smith had been mentioned, uh, but I don't know to what effect. But my view is that Adam Smith uh, got it right back in the, 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 the middle of the 18th century um, when he said that although copyright and other forms of intellectual property formed a monopoly, which in general was a bad thing, this particular set of monopolies was not excessively harmful because three reasons really, it encouraged be beneficial activity, it didn't prevent the provision of competing alternatives, and reward was still ultimately determined by public demand uh, for the product. And it has to be said that over the, the, the 300 years, alternatives to copyright uh, are not thick on the ground. A state reward system, for example, uh, which you might have found in socialist and communist countries uh, until recently, is unsatisfactory because it makes creativity depend on the patronage of the state, and if the state goes bust, uh, so do uh, the creators. On the other side of the, the coin, a completely free market contract system, no copyright at all, would mean that the creator would be most unwise to reveal anything to anyone else <coughs> until they found someone willing to pay for something they had not seen. Or, or alternatively, a fairly strong and readily enforceable law on confidentiality and or personal pr privacy, i.e. if I showed you my work in order to induce you to pay me for it in the fullness of time, you couldn't just walk off uh, and publish that work as your own or, 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 or whatever. Another sort of aspect of the free markets uh, is, if you like, or, or, or the impact that copyright may have inside the free market is actually illustrated by the Google Books settlement, it seems to me, because here uh, you have an enormously powerful organization which is going to reproduce copyright works unless rights holders opt out of the scheme. That's assuming that the court uh, in, in New York approves uh, the, 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 the settlement. Now, the terms and conditions of the scheme are non-negotiable. It's a take-it-or-leave-it situation. I think I have to say that the leave-it probably wouldn't be there if the individual copyrights in the works didn't uh, already exist. So I think the way forward is actually twofold. Um, the first, uh, and I think actually the more practical, um, is to set about the business of persuading people to adapt their copyright practices to changing conditions. And that, in essence, was what the British Academy project of 2006 that Ian uh, mentioned was about. It was essentially trying to get academics and uh, their publishers to reconsider their relative positions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, copyright. And it did actually bear some fruit um, it, because in 2008, after a quite a lengthy discussion and negotiation, um, we managed to produce joint guidelines about the publication of academic research, uh, joint guidelines with the Publishers uh, Association. Now, the Publishers Association did not give up its position that um, it wanted a strong uh, copyright law, um, but it saw value um, in the perspectives that we were able to offer that would qualify. Um, that strong copyright law in a number of areas that were of importance to academic research. What we never quite managed, I think, to do, but still remains a possibility, and maybe there'll be people here this evening who can talk to that, 
uh, was getting in contact with museums and galleries. There was a particular issue, I think, about galleries and the reproduction of artistic works. Um, there's also issues about poetry uh, uh, and so on. We can go into that in more detail later. So that's my first, and as I say, I think more practicable strategy is persuading people to adapt practices because quite a lot of practice actually does not is not dictated by what copyright law says. Copyright law is actually remarkably open-ended. That's why in some ways it's so difficult. Um, but people use that uncertainty in ways which are sometimes, I think it is fair to say, abusive, self-interested, and against the public interest. The second point, um, however, I mustn't neglect because I am a professional law reformer, at least for the moment, and pursuing law reform is, of course, uh, an another strategy. But let me tell you, it is immensely difficult uh, it's always immensely difficult. I can't believe how difficult law reform is. But in this particular case, copyright, it's incredibly difficult because it's not a matter of changing the law in the United Kingdom. It's a, a shifting of the global status quo, or at the very least, the European one. The United Kingdom has remarkably little independence in regard to uh, copyright law policy. There's a whole international framework out there and the European Union, and that is where I think the initiative uh, for the future uh, lies. One could perhaps add a third dimension to this, which is persuading politicians, especially those in government, that the siren songs of the so-called creative industries are not the only ones to listen to when reform is actually going forward. I was glad to hear that point being made in the preceding uh, uh, proceedings as well. Now, I fear that such attempts at persuasion failed during the run up to and the parliamentary passage of the Digital Economy Act. But I do hope for more success, I think there's already a little, with the proposed EU <coughs> legislation extending the term of copyright for sound recordings. Now, the internet and digitization provide nearly all the context for modern copyright law reform, but it is tending to get done in bits. I've mentioned a couple of examples already. The Gower's Review did some bits, but it did not, despite, I think, an, a, a commission to that effect, do a wholesale systematic rethink, such as the internet and digitization seem to me, uh, and to many others, indeed, to, to demand. In particular, the idea that copyright is about the right to prevent unauthorized copying in a world which requires that a copy of a work be made every time somebody accesses it seems wrong in the digital context. It means that potentially the whole internet is one massive series of constant copyright infringements. Now that truth did occur to our legislators who therefore provided that merely temporary copying for the purpose of making the internet work, but otherwise without economic significance, should be the subject of an exception to the general rule that unauthorized copying was wrong. Now a simpler solution might have been to say that only copying that had independent economic significance and was part of normal exploitation, so that the right holder was prejudiced by the act, could be infringement. That would have meant that in the digital environment there was a basic right to copy supporting access to works, but it would belong to the public at large rather than to the person who generated the original work. I've already hinted, the very long duration of copyright is another big issue for me. For the vast majority of works, much shorter periods of time would be enough to ensure a return on works the public liked. I won't specify the time I think it should be, because that's not an easy thing to work out. There are all, lots of factors to consider. But I will say that any proposal to extend the period beyond the currently internationally accepted minima should be resisted, and resisted strongly. And if possible, the international minima should be renegotiated and significantly shortened, perhaps halved. That's a bold statement, but anyway. One of the problems that the long copyright term gives rise to is the so-called orphan work. It seems to me that copyright should be like patents, trademarks, and rugby. Use it or lose it. It's not just about anonymous and pseudonymous works, as the present law has it. It's about the whole wretched business of tracing and identifying rights holders or those who may now represent uh, deceased but still readily identifiable authors. Right now, I'm trying to track down the owner of the copyrights of the well-known artist and cartoonist Emilio Coya, 
who died in 1997. It seems just like yesterday. But it's no easier to track down who currently holds his rights um, uh, than it, uh, because he was and is indeed still famous. Um, it's just simply very difficult. There is no one uh, to tell you. Now the Google Books settlement and other mass digitization projects have thrown this problem into high relief. They've also brought out the problem posed by out of print books. Books are usually out of print because the market for them is too small or indeed non-existent to justify the cost of republication. But digitization and placement on the internet offers the possibility of second and perhaps looking into the future, third and further lives for such works, while also creating fantastic new possibilities for researchers and other seekers after knowledge, understanding, and even possibly entertainment. Should this possibility brought about by digital technology be prevented simply because of rights which are currently not being actively exploited? I would say not. I'll finish here, although much else could be said. Jonathan Griffiths, at the other end of the table, is going to talk about the exceptions to copyright, a vital subject, and maybe he'll also talk about licensing and digital rights management. I'll be very happy myself to go into all these matters and discussions. Meantime, I hope I've said enough to help get the pop bubbling. Thank you.